such in the coming years or probably lifelong. A very infectious uh, contaminated atmosphere is being generated by this COVID-19 exposure and it's the right and apt time for all of us to learn from the real horse's mouth uh, to know what it is. I understand that uh, even in its earlier years, as a chemist or biochemist with Metacope and Petronas, he was an award-winning person. He has inventions and his name relating to treatment, what, treatment of uh, petrochemicals and all. And from there, he had a great start and then moved on. I'm very happy to name that he was, I, I believe, he had an opportunity to work in the colonial system in the Sheffield. I remember my days with uh, uh, the Iruti of uh, Lester and uh, Peter Vanessis and uh, that's uh, very honorable uh, people that's uh, Milroy and Mike Green in Watery Street, Sheffield. I hope uh, he gathered much of his experience from that uh, medical legal center, Sheffield at that Watery Street. Uh, uh, and I think uh, today he will be able to impart all those experience gathered from there and make our group really strong at understanding what is digital autopsy what are its pros and uh, pros and cons and thereby how to adopt a system that we are all ready to change. We all have to ready to change to the new system of leaving our landscape behind and take this tool of a scanner and instead of the autopsy table, we will have to move to that uh, touch screen. I welcome you, uh, dear Matt Chandran, to this uh, webinar series and we are all ready to listen to you over to you sir professor okay. thank you so much that's very kind for you to mention about things that I, i've been trying to do i hope all of you can hear me well uh, and also thank you dr arvin dr siva for this invitation and i have to say how amazing it is that now that suddenly i realized that there is a common denominator between what professor has done in the united kingdom and things that we were trying to do in the United Kingdom for more than 10 years. Indeed, our official headquarters in the United Kingdom is based at the Sheffield Public Mortuary at Watery Street. I'm very pleased to see and hear that Professor had a lot of experience and have done a lot of work over there. And professors like Peter Venazis and Professor Ian Roberts of um, um, John Radcliffe Hospital of uh, Oxford University has been very instrumental in encouraging us to try to implement this concept and also to evolve this concept into what we today call a reality, a reality that in the instance of the United Kingdom became extremely useful during this unfortunate pandemic of COVID-19. Before I continue with the, with, the, with the slide presentation, I just would like to give an idea of the concept that we had some 15 years ago. And I have to say that it is quite amazing to see today that the need for that has become so real today in the situation where due to the infectious na nature of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that leads us to the COVID-19 disease, that all the people of the world are today locked up. They are in a fragmented uh, uh, condition. Organizations are not allowed to come together. People can't interact. But yet we all have a sense of duty that we want to do the best that we can. So the challenge here will be that if people are desirous and excited about wanting to wake up and get something done so that hopefully it benefits the community, the immediate community, the country, and hopefully the, the, the global environment. But how do we do when we all are so far apart? We are restricted in the, in the way we could interact. Today, we can't even go out from our house, but even in the past, if we are to travel from, say, Mumbai to Delhi, Delhi to Bangalore, Bangalore to Kerala, it is quite a distance for all of us to travel to achieve certain common goal. So the whole concept was, what if, if we build a single platform and this platform is a software solution 
just think about like Google, think about like Facebook, whereby it is one common software application that is hosted, let's say for a country in this instance, India. And this platform brings the best of forensic on a common solution. So the world of forensic, as we all know, has two sides to it from the practice point of view. The first is the crime scene investigation, which could also be a death scene. And then the second here is the mortuary, is where the post-mortem examination takes place to ascertain the cause and manner of death. From the sciences point of view, we know that is the best of forensic science, the knowledge that a, a, a group of specialists would like to apply to assist in the process of the crime scene investigation. Similarly, there are the sciences of the forensic medicine, which is primarily driven by the medical knowledge to see how best we can find out what caused the death and how did the, the, the death uh, uh, took place. So to bring all these things into a single solution has been a very, very tough challenge because from the human point of view, from the practitioner's point of view, generally a lot of us, we like a quick fix solution. So yes, indeed the challenge has been, has, has been, has been mountainous, I would say, and it has been a, a travel too far that we have been traveling. So I'm very pleased to hear the, the opening remarks by the professor today, where professor, you mentioned that Kerala and India is ready to evolve, to change, and I am sure from the note of excitement that I'm hearing from you and the colleagues today, that you are also probably wanting to be leading into the future of what, let's call it, the next 10 years could be from hopefully India to the rest of the world. So what I would like to share with you today here is a single platform, a platform that covers the both the crime scene investigation and the post-mortem examination in a non-invasive manner. The reason is very clear because even if we are coming from the angle of the forensic pathologist who wishes to conduct the post-mortem examination in a non-invasive manner, we know the forensic experts needs to know the background of the case at its possible best. Where possible, a lot of time the book of forensics says the pathologists or the medical doctors best to be present at the scene of death for them to appreciate the case background in a lot more intimate manner. But in the real world where we all are limited by the logistics, the geography and the time, I am pretty sure most pathologists do not get the opportunity to get to the scene and for them to appreciate the case background before a post-mortem examination is conducted in the respective mortuary. So the first thinking here is that what if, if we are able to completely digitize the scene of crime in a 3D manner, in a complete 360 degree panorama, and it is to be done in a quick, simple, and easy to use manner, and hopefully cheaper and faster so that at the end of the day, we are able to digitally conserve the whole scene of crime in a beautiful 360 degree virtual environment that can now not only be used as an absolute good quality documentation for presentation in the court of law and also for discussion, but also a digital environment into which further investigation and examination can be conducted whenever and wherever it is necessary. So I'll just walk you through from the scene of crime into the post-mortem examination. So what is this next generation forensic solution or the software that we are referring to? It is an- Mike, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, your screen is out. Please reshare your screen. Are you able to see the screen now? Yes, my carry on. I hope you can see the screen now. Yes, my carry on. All right, thank you. So the thank software you. solution that we termed it as a next generation forensic solution 
is an end-to-end -end enterprise grade crime scene and non-invasive autopsy solution system. It is one platform that allows multiple players to come in and to play. The crime scene investigators who are primarily the police and the biology, biochemical or the molecular biology specialists, all of them can participate within that solution assuming they are given the authorization by their respective head or the directors of the centers. And similarly, on the post-mortem examination yeah, side, once again, those who are authorized to perform their duty within the digital environment, they will be given the rights to use the solution and conduct their daily activity within the common platform. So it is essentially a multiplayer, multi-specialized, heterogeneous stakeholders of police and medical jurisprudence field into one unified integrated analytics system. So that's what it is in a nutshell. So everybody will get access as long as they are authorized and they are able to perform their duties to the limit of the work that is assigned to them by their respective head. So hence the software solution comes with the management, management module. So the two big world within a single solution is obviously the crime scene investigation, whereby it allows an absolute documentation of the whole scene of crime in whatever form that the police has been doing today and also into the future. And secondly, they will be able to reconstruct the entire scene of crime in the form of a complete 360 virtual reality uh, panorama. And finally, it will produce a complete 3D reporting module whereby now the scene of crime can be reported, shared and presented in a complete 3D format. Hopefully, I, if I have the time, I'll be happy to share a case with you. And then the second part will be that how do you now, once the body is removed from the scene of crime and sent to a mortuary with such facilities, how do you conduct a non-invasive autopsy in a totally contactless manner, produce result and again share and report. So moving forward, just very quickly, as I said that there are two sides to the world. One is the crime scene investigation module and the other is the non-invasive autopsy module. If I may just quickly highlight, a lot of confusion normally creeps in when we look at the autopsy because a lot of questions that was always asked that, how do you do toxicology? How do you do microbiology? How do you do histopathology digitally? Because we have had got to have the access to the body. So the answer to that is very simple that a medical doctor who is conducting the post-mortem examination, they will conduct the post-mortem examination digitally on the digital body of the disease. The digital body is an exact copy of the real diseased person. So now once the doctors have conducted the full examination in, in the digital mode, what we call the digital autopsy procedure, now making an assumption that the doctor requires to conduct an histopathology examination or toxicology or microbiology, now the doctors will still have access to the physical body, which is still sitting in the mortuary until a report is written and approved. So the doctors can quickly now through the digital visualization system, do a quick needle biopsy on areas of organs of interest, pull out the biological samples and preserve the sample for it to be sent to the biochemical lab. In most countries, as we all know that the biochemical lab does not sit within the facility of the forensic medicine. It's either a totally a different department or a lot of time it goes outside a certain institution. For instance, like in the case of the United Kingdom, all these samples are actually today sent to the commercial labs that is available in, 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 in most countries and they are not even government owned labs. So the system makes provision for such biological samples to be tagged, barcoded, and to ensure in terms of the chain of custody, it is, it is at its best. And the sample is sent out, tracked, 
And as the results are produced, the results can be now uploaded online and integrated into the digital autopsy examination report by the respective forensic pathologist. So that's how it works. So with the introduction of the NGFS, the new generation forensic solution, what we have also done here is that in consultation with the Royal College of Pathology, we have now promoted what we termed as an improvised standard operating procedure. And it is very simple. All the Royal College of Pathology now says and recommend is when there is a death, if it is an unnatural death, always conduct non-invasive digital autopsy first as the first line intervention. Post digital autopsy procedure, if the doctor thinks he or she needs to do further examination on the physical body of the disease, naturally the physical body is still under the custody of the respective doctor. Using the digital visualization capability, now they can do a minimal incision. The minimal incision is defined by the Royal College of Pathology as any incision in targeted areas of less than 10 inches. Our six, seven years of experience in the United Kingdom today shows us that there is only about three to five inches incision needed if there is ever there is a need for minimal incision. And let's assume post minimal incision and examination, the doctor is still not satisfied. He or she feels that I need to look at the body in a complete manner. They obviously have the full authority and the discretion for them to proceed with a full invasive post-mortem. So it is a stepwise approach, as you can see, a non-invasive digital autopsy and follow through with the minimal incision if it is necessary. And if it is still not satisfied, obviously a full physical invasive post-mortem examination is the final step. So the, again, the five to six years of, of, of experience in the, in the United Kingdom and in many parts of the world that we were involved, that we have seen today more than 85% of all cases are conducted in a totally non-invasive manner, which means that a doctor doesn't even have to touch the physical body. And the physical body remains within the body bag. About 10 to 15% of the cases may require minimal incision. Less than 5% of the cases requires full invasive post-mortem examination. And we think that this is quite a nice balance of, let's say, 80-20, whereby about 80% of the cases can be very elegantly, quickly, and efficiently examined, and a very high quality report with complete, comprehensive documentation made and released to the next of kin without, with or without any interruption. We hope with with absolute minimal interruption so that the family can proceed with their usual funeral rites and so on. Our experience again shows that in less than 30 minutes, every case can be released. So uh, it, it takes about maximum 10, 30 minutes to get a case, let's call it out of the, out of the door. So if I may just move forward now, the crime scene investigation module, as we know, the, the conventional process is very, very arduous, very laborious, and it requires quite a big number of, of, of human resource. And for us, one of the biggest issues that we have always noticed in the crime scene investigation procedures are what we call the varying style, varying techniques, and also a lot of discretionary way of documenting and investigating the scene of crime. So our proposal here is for the crime scene investigation investigators to embrace a standardized standard operating procedure, a simplified standard oper operating procedure that will eventually produce a very high quality crime scene 3D report. And we are also suggesting to them to embrace and to continue using the devices which they have already invested. And therefore there is no new money, if I may say, 
that needs to be invested in a, in a, in a big sum. It will just require some simple modification because most, most of the devices like a DSLR camera, tripod and various things are normally in the possession of the crime scene investigators. But from the conventional process, if you look at it, it is a very long, laborious process with a lot of discretionary uh, steps. Hence, you will see a tremendous amount of inconsistency. And most importantly, most crime scene investigators will agree that they are heavily subjected to cognitive bias. Because every crime scene investigator, if I'm allowed to say, the moment they walk in into a scene of crime, their point of view is that, oh, I know, okay, let's take this, let's take that, and we are good with that, and that's good enough. Because they have already formed an opinion in their mind. The biggest question in the world of forensic will be, what happened the moment you walk away later in the evening, tomorrow, a week after, suddenly a question pops up in your mind, what about this? Did we check that? By then, as we all know, the scene of crime would have literally disappeared or would have changed. So, again, we are not short of challenges. And I think that I have uh, listed down all these uh, challenges that we typically will face in terms of the documentation and the information sharing, the complexity of it, and so on. And I think that I'm not going to go into each and one of that. I'm pretty sure that all the participants can appreciate how difficult it is for crime scene investigation is to be done and the inconsistency and complexity that it brings along. So the proposal within the next generation forensic solution is for one to embrace a simplified, highly standardized, easy to use, quick solution and hopefully with very small investment of money and time. So when there is the scene of crime, a quick digital documentation to be done using standard items that is normally available at the disposal of the investigators like tripod, camera, video recorder, audio recorder. And today we see more and more of the drone application is being used, whereby the police drone unit may launch the drone to do an aerial recording of the scene of crime. The key to the whole uh, practice will be that once such digital documentation has been done, all that is to be quickly uploaded directly from the point of sight. There and there, through a simple connectivity, it doesn't have to be a super high bandwidth or anything, into the software environment. The moment it is uploaded into the software environment, now the whole original set of data, complete with its metadata, which means every single data that should be in place to ensure there is an absolute data integrity, data security, and also the whole chain of custody is at its best, all managed by the software solution automatically will be stored in a central database as to be approved by the client. In this instance, instance is always the police in a safe and secured manner. Now, once the data has been sent to a central, central area, what we are proposing here is that now the investigators or the police department has got two options. The first option is for the same investigator now to sit at his Mike. desk. Hello? Mike, sorry for interfering. Your screen is out. Please ah. uh, reshare the screen. Okay. Yes, Mike, carry on. Okay, thank you. So now the two options here is that one is for the same investigating officer to whom the case has been assigned to now sit in the office, you know, within their, his or her laptop and start reconstructing the crime scene that was documented earlier into a 360 degree virtual reconstruction or the, the making an assumption that this is a, a regional or a, or, a, or a state or a district facility, they can have a few civilians who has got some basic level of forensic science training whereby they can function as a central unit who will generate the report for the crime scene investigators. So the idea here is what we are seeing more and more is that the policeman 
who is the crime scene investigator is best to be on the field doing the policing job, investigation job, the enforcement job. The policeman is never the best, best document writer, is never the best report producer. So therefore, to make sure that from the policing point of view for the police department to have the best impact on the ground to the satisfaction of the general public, it is always good for the policeman to be unleashed as an enforcement officer and let some civilians with some basic forensic science of training for them to undertake the documentation and reporting job for the police or the investigating officer. By this, we are optimizing and we are increasing the efficiency in terms of the use of specialized resource. Because we hear over and over in all countries, maybe the United States, UK, India, Malaysia, Singapore, the, their biggest comment here is that every year we hire policemen and we don't have enough policemen because all the policemen, they disappear. The question to be asked here from the management here, where are the policemen that we, we hired? The biggest answer and the most correct answer here, they all are sitting behind their computer in the office and struggling with their documentation and reporting. And therefore, they just can't spend the time that they're supposed to spend on the street with the general public to provide the comfort of enforcement, safety, and security. So now, once this, this report is produced, now this report can be shared with the investigating officer or it's produced by the investigating officer itself, depending on how the client choose to set it up, and it will be good to go. So I think that at this juncture, I will just share in the interest of time, I'll just share a quick uh, live solution that we have. And I'm quite pleased to inform the participants here is that India has already made that, that first step forward. India is thinking through on how best to create an Indian model, a model that will be vast, large, and all encompassing to make sure that we are able to improve the services within the Indian, if I may say, the forensic fraternity. So this is an initiative that has already taken place in the state of Maharashtra in uh, Nasik uh, in India. So what I'm launching now here is a live solution that was deployed for the Maharashtra state on a pilot. It is a crime scene documentation, reconstruction and reporting module that I spoke to you about. I hope the participants can see the screen. Is the screen clear? Hello, Dr. Aravind. So now the first thing here is that where is this? As you can see now, it is Im embedded into the system. whereby now you can see obviously into the report, it has been embedded that this is in a location in India, in the state of- Mike, Mike uh, the screen is out. Uh, please reshare the screen. Some, some persons are unintentionally sharing their screen. Sorry for the inconvenience. Sorry, I think uh, I'll just... Uh, yeah, carry on, Mike. Yeah. So what I was just saying was that where is this case? This case is obviously in a country called India, in the state of Maharashtra, in a district called Nasik, which is uh, in a place called rural Nasik. And you can see that in terms of the location, the GPS location in this instance, it has already been automatically embedded into the report of that that one single case. Obviously, you do have an option of doing a live GPS location, assuming that now you are in the investigation mode. Now you can choose to launch your, your Google location and try to identify where are you in terms of the location of this case. 
and this will be very useful during the presentation in the court of law and this also will be very useful during the peer to peer uh, discussion and also a discussion between the investigating officer and the and the um, uh, public prosecutor should the case is believed to will be will, will go for trial uh, Sorry, I think I lost the screen again. Yes, Matt, your screen is, oh yeah, it's working, carry on. Okay, it's working. So this, yes. is, this is what we call the crime scene investigation. Investigators, they obviously know that this is the way they will normally approach here is a station or a base by base. But this system can capture and amalgamate as many bases or as many station as you wish to. Can you see the screen now? Yes, my carry on. Yeah, sorry, because I think there is a conflicting pre presentation that's going on because it keeps on tripping the system for that reason. So my yeah, actually, some student, uh, some persons are uh, sharing their screen, maybe uh, unintentionally. Yeah, carry on. Yeah. Right, sorry. So, so um, sorry. Let me see that whether I can relaunch the system because. Uh, I think as we would expect, it keeps on disconnecting because of the bandwidth issue and make an assumption. So we all are fighting for the bandwidth. Yeah, Mike, carry on, no problem. So it is, it is completely, you know, it's either it can be operated on an automatic manner or it can be operated in a, in a, in a manual manner by whomsoever that is, that is uh, using it. Matt, uh, sorry to say your screen is again having issue. So you can see yeah, the screen. Carry on, Mike. Yes, carry on. So what I will do the in the interest of time, I will just go straight to the to the base where Uh, Mike, uh, your audio is mute, I think. We are not able to hear you. Yeah, I think um, now, no, now... Now it's clear. Carry on. Yeah. No, so I'm, I'm sure that you saw the various images which has all been recorded and embedded into a, into a, into a, 
a common uh, system. So the whole, whole what we call the 360 virtual environment can be annotated, it can be tagged, both the macro and the micro image and everything and anything, any form of documentation that one wishes to do today can all be done and, uh, and um, embedded into a single volume in the form of a complete 360. So the idea here is just to give various kind of flexibility to the, uh, to the investigating officers so that they have got all the flexibility that they need in order for them to be able to do the work that they are supposed to do. In this instance, as you can see, the FI, Indian FIR is embedded and a case file is embedded describing the case. It can be both in text, you know, it can be in audio, video. And as I mentioned that eventually when a post-mortem report and various reports are produced by the investigating, uh, by the examining doctors and submitted to the investigating officers, now those reports can also be eventually embedded into, into, the, into the system. Whether it's the post-mortem report, tox report, and so on and so forth. So as a summary that this is, this is essentially just to give an idea of a little pilot that is already taking place in, in, in Nasik and how the Indian police, they realize that a location which is like almost 250 kilometers, if I'm not mistaken, away from, uh, from Mumbai can now embrace the system with absolute minimal investment and literally less than half a day of quick training and now they are able to produce a report. And this report was produced by, by a team of investigating officers that was based in, 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 in Nasik. So I think that I will uh, just close this uh, application and move to the next module. I hope you can see the screen now. Yes, Mike, carry on. Yeah. So now, as we all know, once the crime scene investigation process has taken place, the documentation has been done and the police is happy. Now what the police will normally do here is that they will instruct for the body to be moved to a mortuary. Within the common platform solution that we are talking about, what we are suggesting now here is that uh, the body is to be moved to what we term as a digital autopsy facility. So now once the body comes to the digital autopsy facility, obviously the body is being tracked because it was indexed at the scene of crime. The system know the travel route and the system know that the body has now been checked in or registered into certain mortuary or in a certain or locations. So now what is the non-invasive autopsy process? Obviously the system provides all management and administration capability for the body to be reported to a uh, mortuary. And once it's in the mortuary, the body will be scheduled for scanning, what we term as a digitization process. And the kind of scanner that we use here is a standard CT scanner, 64 slides that has been reconfigured for the use of forensic. And once the reconfiguration has been done, it will be interfaced to the NGFS software environment. With that, now the doctors are able to schedule for the scanning or digitization of the body. The system will notify the respective doctors at every step that is taking place. And they will know when the digitization or the scanning will take place. And when the right time comes, the system will give a trigger to the mortuary att attendant for the mortuary attendant now to pull out the body from the storage facility, assuming it's within the storage, and for it to be uh, stretched to the scanning room, which is normally uh, within a within, you know, few, few meters distance. And all these little micro steps are all captured by the software, again, for the purpose of chain of custody and also to ensure there is integrity at work. Now, once the body has been completely digitized, and the data quality check 
has been checked and, and approved, the body will be now released for the body to be put back into the, into the storage. And the respective uh, pathologist or the medical doctor will be given a notice saying that now the body is ready for digital autopsy examination. The doctor has got a few options, making an assumption that the doctor is seated within the same facility. Obviously, from their chamber or office, they can conduct a digital autopsy examination. They have an option of walking into a postmortem hall and conduct the digital autopsy procedure with the physical body next to them, should they wish to. All the external examination of the body, which is true normally, photography and so on, will all be included or embedded into the postmortem report. Oh, if the doctor is in a location, let's say far away from the digital autopsy facility, they have got the remote capability for them to dial in and get the digital autopsy report done. And this remote location can be within the, the, the border of the country or even in the international location. So there is just simply no limit from where the duty can be performed and all capabilities and facilities are provided as long as that individual is an authorized individual and that case is assigned to that, that uh, specific, specific doctor. So the conventional process, we all know that it is not something that we all uh, want it to be that way. Unfortunately, we need to do that. The new solution is all about having a squeaky clean environment. So to the professor that if I may share that when we first landed in the United Kingdom, Professor Peter Venazis of Queen Mary University of London and Professor Ian Roberts of John Radcliffe Oxford told me that, can you show to us whether you can build a facility that is squeaky clean where I don't want to see even a drop of stain on the floor or on the table. And this squeaky clean also has got to be such that everything can be traced, everything can be audited, and everything can be retrieved for various other purposes, education, training, and also for other form of cross audit functions. And I'm quite pleased to inform that today, all the digital autopsy facilities in any country that we operate will never look like the mortuary that we all are used to. It is truly squeaky clean and it will end up being a, 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 a facility that will give a lot more of a fascination, if I may say, rather than a gruesome feeling. So as you can see, this is only a concept. As you can see that on your right, you will have various terminals showing you the crime scene uh, lo location where the whole thing is took place. And this will be normally given to the investigating doctor sorry, the examining doctor by the investigating officer. The investigating officer can choose, not, can choose not to give access to the examining doctor for whatever security, security or, or, or other, other reason. But assuming the investigating officer gives an access to the examining doctor, now the examining doctor will be able to access and appreciate the scene of crime, what took place at the scene of death, and the entire background of that all in a true 360 virtual panorama. The doctor can conduct the digital autopsy procedure using a mouse by clicking on the various digital capabilities, digital scalpel that is given to the doctor for them to conduct the digital autopsy procedure, whichever they want. Or they could also use the touch system to use their fingers and cut and investigate whichever they, way they want. But what we have essentially built into the system from capabilities point of view is that unlimited option for the doctors to examine the digital body of the deceased in ultra high definition. And while such investigations, sorry, examinations are being conducted as, as to be decided by the examining doctors, the system uh, compiles a post-mortem report. So it's very simple uh, a process once the whole facility is up and running, body comes to the mortuary, the whole administrative uh, process takes place within the software solution. The scanning of the body takes place in less than 10 minutes. The through digitization act, we call it, is only less than two minutes. 
a, per, a, a body can be scanned in about one minute and 45 seconds and the data will be quickly checked by the system automatically and the body can now be released if the doctor choose to release the body and the digital body of the disease now ready for examination. Typically, a report can be produced every 30 minutes by a doctor who's fairly, fairly well trained. So what will the doctor say? The doctor will see everything in 3D, but they can choose to see in 2D. The difference between a radiology and a forensic pathology here is that the forensic pathologies, they work on a black box. They need to see everything and anything that they wishes to see. And when they see, they see the 3D body of the disease. So the system is built for the specific use of the forensic pathologies, whereby they get to see the body exactly the way they used to see the body, the physical body in 3D. And in the system, obviously it's because of the system capability, should they choose to generate two, three copies of the body, they are free to do that so that they can examine the body whichever way they wish to. So these are all snapshots of the 3D body. And you can appreciate the definition of lungs and so on that you can see that that will give you a, a, a real reason why diagnosing the death of a person due to COVID-19 is extremely easy within a digital autopsy facility because almost all or 100% of the death due to the COVID-19 condition here is either an alveolar exud exudative, interstitial inflammation, and that will be the common reason why finally the person died. So in terms of the visualization, again, the examining doctor is not limited. They are free to see the body whichever way they wishes to see the body in any form, any angle, and it is entirely up to the way they see it because it is an investigative uh, process. So if you allow me that I'll just run a short, short video. I, I believe that the video probably gives you a better picture. Yes, Mike, carry on. Yeah. This is the main digital autopsy center professor at Watery Street, Sheffield. As you can see that the body doesn't even have to come out of the body bag. The body remains within the body bag for a variety of medical and social and in most instances can also be the religious reason. And the body can be scanned in less than two minutes.
So this is a classic example of the examination of the lung where in the instance of the COVID-19, it is literally less in less than five minutes, the doctors are able to ascertain the cause of death and then just sign off the death of the person with a, with a, with a simple report on the cause of death. In the case of a gunshot wound, the system can be launched into an automatic mode or semi-automatic, whereby the system will track and look for all the bullets and the shrapnels, and it will generate a log of all those bullets and the shrapnels and everything that is found, foreign bodies that's found in the body of the deceased. And it's for the forensic pathologists to eventually agree and accept if they agree with the finding of the system. Uh, but the key to it here is, is that every bit of the foreign bodies that was found inside the body of the disease will be recorded in 3D and it can be retrieved and traced when, when and where there is a need for it to be, for it to be done.
excuse me, Matt, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, you're, uh, are you uh, presenting and then uh, speaking also? Uh, Hello? No, I'm, not, I'm not speaking. No, I'm, I'm not speaking. Okay. Uh, because there are yes. lots of uh, say people who are saying uh, the audio is not available, that's why. Okay, thank you. Thank no, you so no, much. Sorry no, for no the... Audio. Yeah. Uh, sorry this will be done in one minute. Okay, okay, okay. For those with interest in forensic odontology, this will be a very, very handy device where they can extend this very easily into a forensic odontology specialization. Uh, that will be the end of uh, my presentation. And I think that uh, I hope I've given a, a, a reasonably a good idea or an overview with regards to what we are uh, proposing and what we are working on and obviously if i may say at the end of the day it, this is very much a, a start although we have traveled the distance quite a bit but i have to say that we are standing on the shoulder of many many forensic experts that has been very kind to share their their experience their knowledge and also their 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 well wishes to us so i thank all those who participated in the webinar today and also for the invitation should you have any question, I'll be very happy to answer those questions. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, let us have the questions in the chat box, please. Uh, I request all the participants to type in the questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, we'd had one from... Uh, uh, one second. We had one. Uh, what are the limitations of digital autopsy using this software? That's one of the questions uh, posed on to you, sir. Matt, if you can answer that. Thank you. What are the limitations of digital autopsy using this software? Yeah, thank you so much. You know, for the question, you know, I, I apologize that the way I may answer may not be very, very um, good to many. That I think here we are comparing, if I may say, a word processor to a typewriter. In the past, we had the typewriter. The typewriter has served the needs of many. And we have to appreciate that it has served our needs extremely well, for which we are very thankful. But however, we have leaped forward to the word, world of word processor, whereby now the word processor is the new standard of the day. Therefore, if we try to compare the word processor to the typewriter, in my view, we are being extremely unfair to the typewriter. Because in the world of digital autopsy, if I may say that it can do wonders by the standard of the day, obviously a lot of capabilities of the digital autopsy can never be performed in a conventional postmortem examination. However, we all will agree at the end of the day, should there is a need for us to cross-examine, cross-investigate, just to be doubly sure the Invasive postmortem examination on the physical body remains as the final gold standard process. And we are not against the invasive, invasive postmortem examination. As you would have seen in the improvised standard operating procedure, what we are proposing, why don't we always do the digital autopsy procedure as the first line intervention? With that, 80, 85, 90% of the routine cases can be completed in a fast and elegant manner without any emotional pain to the family. And also taking into interest the, the, the safety of the, of, the, of the medical personnel. But for us, the key value that we saw here is by doing so, we are unleashing the quality intellectual thinking of the professors, the associate professors, the forensic pathologists, the doctors, and everyone for them to work on cases that they want to work because they are in the process of discovery of new knowledge. Rather than the doctors are saddled by what is and has already termed by the medical fraternities 
as routine cases. Most professors will say in my 25, 30, 35 years of experience, by just looking at the body, I can write a post-mortem report. That's what they have always been telling me. And most of my friends today are all, for, are all uh, uh, forensic experts, and I'm not a medical doctor myself, so I've learned a lot from all of them. And they always say, man, by just looking at it, I can tell you. So my questions to my dear professor friends have always been, if that's the case, then why do you want to go about cutting up the body, if I may say so? The answer, because we never had the choice in the past. It's not that we want to do that. What we want to do here is an intellectual function whereby we generate new knowledge and knowledge that we would like to share with peers and students. So I firmly believe the, 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 the beauty of this, this leap forward in the form of the digital autopsy procedure here is that it now allows the medical professionals for them to do what they always wanted to do. That is discovery of knowledge, sharing and educate the new generation. How? So that they are not to be saddled with the routine procedure which can be done using the digital autopsy system in an efficient and an elegant manner. So I think that that's how I would like to address that question. Uh, one more question, Matt. This is from uh, Dr. Abhi Joseph. Matt, is on-site or mobile autopsies possible with your technologies? Absolutely. There are, there are multiple what we call modalities that we can deploy so that in a large country, what we will normally suggest was a network of digital autopsy facilities whereby you can tier it into tier one, tier two, tier three. The tier one will be like a central facility, two, tier two will be like, the, let's call it one step down, and then the tier three will be what we call a relocatable digital autopsy facility. So essentially, the, the, the whole capabilities of the system is packed into like a container box. It is not a container box, it is a custom-made solution which can be landed in any location that you wishes to rapidly, and it will be all connected into the network in such a way that eventually it all get integrated in a seamless manner. And with that, also the capital investment that is necessary will be a lot, a lot lower. So yes, the short answer to that is yes. One more question, Matt, this is from Himan Shu. Can we detect poisoning cases using digital autopsy? Yes, the digital autopsy procedure is a pre medical procedure conducted by the trained pathologist. And assuming that in a case post-examination, the doctor is of view that this death could be due to poisoning because they can't see any other evidences. What they will do here is that they will do a needle biopsy on the physical body of the disease using the visualization capabilities. And essentially it's very simple. It's just a syringe in a targeted manner. The doctor know what kind of sampling they have to do. It doesn't cost any money. It's probably cost less than 10, 10 rupees or 15, 15 rupees syringe. And now they do the sampling of the, 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 in the areas of their interest and that samples are to be sent to the tox lab for toxicologic, uh, toxicological analysis. And once the report is out, the report can be out, uploaded into the system. The medical, uh, the pathologist will have an access to that. Now they can confirm the cause of death. And there's absolutely uh, no reason for the body to be intruded. Uh, Matt, the next question is from Shalini Das. How MPR visualization differs from normal 2D or 3D visuals? The MPR visualization in this instance is built for forensic pathologies. It is built to the eye and the routine of the investigating or sorry, the examining doctors. So that we, from our experience shows the forensic pathologies, they look at and look into the body for internal examination in their own way. They don't do it like how a radiologist will do. Because a radiologist, with all respect to the, our, our friends in radiology, they always know what they are looking for. Because there was a clinic, consulting clinician, the consulting clinician has requested for radio imaging. And when radio imaging is done, the radiologist is going to confirm, hopefully, what the consulting physician was suspicious of. 
but we all know the world of forensic is an investigative process. We are starting with the black box, not knowing what happened. And therefore, the way the forensic pathologist will examine, will look into is, 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 is very different from the way a typical radiological examination is done. So therefore, the next generation forensic solution is built specifically for the world of forensic. Okay, the next question, uh, Matt, is from Dr. Rajkumar MG. How to know the weight of organs in digital autopsy? Yes, the weight of the organ in the digital autopsy right now, it, it, it definitely cannot, cannot be, be uh, measured. And the size of the organ can be measured easily. The volume of the organ can be measured easily and in a very accurate manner. The next question is from Dr. Chandrakant Hungund. Can this digital software be edited and what is its weightage in courts? The weightage is, is a very good question. Today, in the UK and all countries that we have been operating, the digital autopsy report is admitted as an evidence in the court. And as a matter of fact, in the UK High Court today, the UK High Court requires the examining pathologist to have conducted digital autopsy examination where the facility is available. The only time a doctor can attend a court without a digital autopsy report is if they don't have access to the facility. So similarly, our experience even in India where we have been now having some engagement, the, the Indian um, Evidence Act clearly has defined and there has been a consultation from the National Law University whereby there was a participation from, from a very, very large group from across India whereby this consultative group Having, having reviewed all the, all the Evidence Act and then uh, CPRC of, of, of India, they have concluded and recommended the use of digital autopsy as a first line intervention. And there is no dispute with the, with the, on the legality side of it. It was chaired by a former Supreme Court judge. Okay, the other, there are two questions which are, uh, I think you probably answered them. Uh, this is one is from Aishwarya R. How the trace of poisons can be identified if it is a poisoning death, poison death case? And another from Ankita Kakkar. How to collect tissue samples for DNA and forensic toxicology? I think you've already answered this, uh, but if you could like yes. to add. Yes, sir. So as I, as I mentioned in a, in, in, in a typical post-mortem examination, the examining doctor will do an external examination. Having done the external examination, all the observations would have been recorded into the system, all photographic evidence and everything. And then they will proceed with the internal examination using the digital autopsy capabilities. Now, the fact that they have had the benefit of doubt of the case background at the scene of death, having had looked at the external condition of the body, now they have got an excellent idea of what they are looking at internally speaking using the digital capabilities. Now, having done the internal examination using the digital capabilities on the digital body of the, of, the, of the disease, now they make a decision that I need to run a toxicology on this person or I need to run a DNA identification on the person for the purpose of human identification or so. In that sense, all they have to do is the, a simple syringe and they do a needle biopsy for biological sampling purpose but now, because they have got the power of digital visualization in their hand, they are able to do the sampling in a lot more precise and targeted manner. And they collect the biological samples, preserve it, and send it to the either a, a DNA lab for DNA fingerprinting or send it to a tox lab for toxicology analysis. Once the results are produced, it can be interfaced into the software environment the next moment it will be compiled into the primary report of the diseased person and the doctor responsible for the case will be given a notification saying that such report has been embedded and the doctors are free to review that as they see uh, to their convenience. Uh, one more uh, different question that is from uh, Alan James, Dr. Alan James. Any method to determine the time since death in digital autopsy or should the determination uh, be made by conventional methods? Yes, I, 
I, I, if, if I might may share against things that we have experienced, that we were working very, very hard on the external examination of the body and also the documentation of the external findings on the body. So one of the most interesting points that was highlighted to me long ago, almost 15 years ago by, by a professor that I hold very dear to my heart was that he told me, Matt, when we can, we have the body, we can see the body, we can photograph the body in super high definition. All we have to do here is now to integrate those data into the postmortem report. There is no reason for you to work too hard to develop a very expensive system, a very sophisticated system that happens to be very complicated to use in order for you to document the external examination. So similarly, when I look at a lot of things that, you know, in the case of the time, you know, since that, right, it can easily done using the conventional wisdom and also the analytics and the experience that the doctors they have. And although, although I have to admit that, yes, indeed, you know, we are involved in a number of research on how to determine the time, uh, time, time of death using uh, the, the digital capabilities. And we do have an answer to that. And in future, you will definitely see that being applied within the system capability. Although we, we, we didn't do that at this juncture, simply for the reason that I have, I've shared with you that it makes the whole process a lot more complicated but it generates very little value from the solution point of view. Uh, there are a couple of more questions uh, about the reliability. This is from Pawan Shekhawat. How reliable is this when compared to the conventional autopsy? And next is from Dr. Arun Kumar J.S. How to collect viscera for further examination? Yep. As the proponent of the digital autopsy solution and also the NGFS, Obviously that we are of view that this is far superior. And in the past, when a, when a person like me makes such statement, there is always a big question mark next to it. But today I think I'm quite happy to share with all our friends over here that this has been proven as a very, very useful and meaningful uh, solution for forensic experts to apply. And also it has been a very, very big uh, development within the medical legal and also from the societal um, sentiments point of view. So I have to say that yes, indeed, this is a leap forward. It is highly accurate, far superior and extremely comprehensive in terms of it, its total value stack. So as for any specific needs for, for uh, collection of viscera and so on, Obviously, the examining doctor has the option to do a minimal incision. So as I mentioned earlier, the Royal College of Pathology in its guidance specifies minimal incision as any incision in a targeted area of less than 10 inches. In the real life, we see a lot of it between three to five inches, depending on what the doctor chooses, chooses to do. And obviously the location of, of their interest on the, on the body of the disease. Next uh, question is that, uh, this is from uh, Vidya Sagar Pragasam. In how many countries digital autopsy is recognized to be used? Legally speaking that today digital autopsy is being recognized and has been recognized in all, all major, major countries. For instance, like in the UK, in Malaysia, and even recently, as I mentioned that about six months ago, there was a consultation in India and a paper was, white paper was released in saying in support, the United States, especially in the state of California, there is a law passed in, 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 uh, in support of the digital autopsy, whereby in state of California now, all, all uh, cases are recommended to be conducted using the digital method. But there are, there are uh, many instances in many countries, that, as we all will expect and see, there has been some hesitation. The hesitation, I would generally say, is a kind of hesitation that we have seen in all countries that we have been simply because lack of familiarity. It's just like the day when we were using computer, a lot of us were struggling in computer when the applications on the computer changes or certain software gets updated, we all will still struggle. And also when it moves from one modality of a desktop to the laptop, to the handphone, to the pads and so on, 
we all will need to put in a little bit of shall i say effort in order for us to get a good degree of familiarity but i think at the end of the day the, the society as a whole the practitioners and also the, the the general public will always want to move forward i think the challenge to us the leaders have always been who among us who is going to push this forward so that we are ahead in terms of the curve of development and again again i have to say that you know i i have been in a way engaging in india for about a year and a half now i do see a lot of uh, uh, leaders among the among the world of uh, forensic in india who's who's stepping up and this very webinar that we are having today now with the ifsca is a, is a proof icfsa sorry is a proof that you are taking the the lead to to realize something that is good for shall i call the world of forensic and also the 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 general public so yes now we are we are very very positive about this uh, there are a few more questions which are uh, repeats uh, there are more or less uh, repeats there are about legal implications of digital autopsy by dr arun kumar uh, etc there is one more uh, thing that is this is from uttam uh, medicity can forensic expert alone conduct this digital autopsy or uh, does it require a team i am, i think it should be uh, should it be how many persons are required to conduct this uh, autopsy digital autopsy uh, in a in a in a routine uh, post mortem examination it is essentially a one person work for instance the easiest example i can give here that is a, 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 a that is a case let's say in kerala it is assigned to a doctor and the doctor happens to be in london today and there is a global lockdown and the case still can be conducted by the doctor from london using the remote capabilities so essentially it is a one 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 person activity however should the doctor choose to do a peer to peer collaboration now the doctor can give access to the second person for sec second opinion consultation peer review and so on and so forth but where multi specialized specialization is involved and the doctor wishes to tap into such capabilities obviously all forms of uh, of capabilities are built into the system for the doctor to call in for multi specialization participation so yes and at the end of the day the doctors decide in a very very high profile highly complicated cases we have seen two three different specialization participating Uh, concurrently and that's very possible and doable it's in simple word i will say that you the doctor you decide because you are the boss of it and you are the forensic expert so, someone like us our job here is to build the capabilities into the solution uh one more question i think this should be the last one is it possible to detect death due to electrolytic imbalance or biochemical changes this is from anwar abdul rahman uh again i think that that as i said the post post digital autopsy procedure on the body of the disease it's for the examining doctor to decide further biochemical uh, uh examination that they wishes to conduct if they see the need to do that and so that that's the thing yes uh madam dr sherly madam also has a question we now are clear that we were straining so much with less productivity Uh, i think she'll comment about this a little later because she's also given another uh, say question virtual arms consoles and distant remote controller and uh, assessor for all of us uh, uh, how does it look like uh is the professor referring to the robotic arms robotic arms yes uh, yeah again as i mentioned that some capabilities are very much at the research level and i think that uh, assuming there are in the in the network let's say assume the the the, the in national network of 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 india assuming there are groups that has got such interest whereby apart from the services they also have got the academic interest yes maybe in one or two locations that you can consider having such capabilities but in terms of investment is going to cost money but in terms of the day to day routine post mortem services it is absolutely not necessary but as a company when we consult our client and then we design a network and capabilities we will lay all this on the table and it's for the client to decide where they want 
what kind of capabilities. And obviously you will agree in the world that we are living today, the more we build into it, it the more it's going to cost. So we, in, in our, in our uh, lesson that we learned in, in India, we think it is a great lesson that we learned. We are trying to, through consultation, build what we term as an Indian model. An Indian model is going to be an all encompassing uh, uh, network that will be able to provide services for all in the most affordable manner so that India makes the first leap forward and they make the huge gain. The gain going to be India is probably the only country that can have at least, at least the way I see the largest number of post-mortem examinations conducted on a digital solution. And I'm sure all of us here with medical background, we will be able to appreciate the value of the database that you will be sitting on. And I think that the rest, I, I shall leave it to the imagination to all the good doctors and researchers that we have in India who have done a wonderful job. And we will be very happy to participate alongside with you before we start building into other highly sophisticated, complicated and capital intensive systems into the network for a variety of reasons. Matt, uh, in light of uh, what you've just said, uh, Dr. Chandrakant Hungund, professor, very senior professor from uh, the Department of Forensic Medicine, JSS Medical College, my senior colleague, has given an open invitation for you. He comments uh, before leaving saying that it's a very informative uh, session and we will look forward to possibilities of collaborating with your esteemed institute with our JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research, Mysore, Karnataka. Uh, maybe we will be in touch also because I'll, uh, I'm also from the same organization. We'll be in touch with this. Uh, with this, we'll uh, stop the question and answer sessions. I now request uh, Madam uh, to uh, give the concluding remarks so that I can uh, end the session. So I would like to th thank everyone for, for this invitation and also that I, I have always mentioned that, yes, we have been the proponent of this, but I, I would like to thank everyone because we are where we are because we are standing on the shoulder of a lot of great people who has been with us and who has contributed immensely. What we have done here is what we could do till yesterday and what we can do tomorrow will be extremely exciting for us. And therefore we always look forward to collaborating and working with all those great professors, doctors and all other uh, stakeholders who has got interest in the world of forensic. So thank you so much for the invitation. I request uh, Dr. Shirley uh, Wasu, Madam, uh, to give her concluding remarks in this so that we can wind up the session. Before I hand over to Madam, uh, this is for all the participants. Kindly mention your full name and email ID in the chat box as the session is about to end. So that you will be receiving your uh, certificates, e-certificates. Uh, the e-certificates will be available one week later. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, but uh, please wait for uh, Madam's concluding remarks before you finish it. I now call upon uh, uh, Madam uh, for her concluding remarks in this session. Shirley, ma'am, are you there? Dr. Shirley Vasu, ma'am. Sir, I think ma'am lost the connection. Uh, please conclude by yourself, sir, if possible. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shiva Prasad. Today we've had a very wonderful uh, session, uh, which was, uh, say, not just a uh, technological leap, as we had always, uh, say, sort of uh, going uh, uh, with transformation through technology from the Indian Society of Criminology and Forensic Science. But we've also had a very wonderful uh, uh, speaker also presenting this. That is, uh, say, uh, today's webinar had uh, come out in an excellent way. I thank uh, Mr. Matt A. Chandran, the founder director of Hygiene uh, Technologies London, Info Valley Group. We've also had an opportunity to listen to one of the domains of forensic medicine uh, in uh, India, that is uh, Dr. Shirley Wasu, who is a very senior professor and who's had lots of accolades to her credit also. Uh, with this, uh, we will uh, conclude this session and we'll look forward to further participation of all. Uh, and uh, lots of more interaction also from all of you. 
uh, I'll, I'd like to thank the office bearers, that is the uh, Dr. Shiva Prasad, Dr. Fabian Baby, and all who have uh, enabled us to uh, meet such international level scholars also, sitting at our uh, respective homes very safely. On behalf of all the participants, uh, I thank, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Matt, profusely for uh, uh, sharing your time with us and then uh, sharing your ideas and also the technologies. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Professor Dr. Shirley Wasu for uh, sparing her time also and then joining us and then guiding us through this illustrative session. Uh, I thank all the participants for having taken so much of uh, active interest in this. With this, we will uh, conclude this session. It's almost time. So that uh, I'll thank you for your patience also. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.